Okay, let's just keep this rolling. Um, we are back here now, here with Evan number two. Sorry, you're second, so you're Evan number two. This is Evan Johnson. It's alphabetical order, <laughs> actually. <laughs> with, uh, with Segment. So Segment, if you're not familiar, is a, a super awesome data analytics company here in San Francisco. I've been a longtime fan and customer at multiple different companies of Segment. So very nice to have you here and meet you, uh, meet you in person. Um, one of the reasons why I reached out to you to, to come talk here is you, uh, you know, Segment has always written very good engineering blog, blog posts and has been very transparent about your practices. And you recently wrote a post about some of your, uh, your AWS practices, how you manage multiple accounts across your entire organization. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about um, your team makeup and what were some of the factors that kind of led you to that kind of model on AWS. Sure. So we're not quite there yet where <laughs> we uh, have people super siloed off in all of these different AWS accounts. but. Um, we are starting to shave off like major pieces of our infrastructure and put them like out of sight and out of mind in other AWS accounts that uh, are not like one giant prod account. Uh, so we've done this like with like DNS. Our DNS all lives in another account. Our all of the customer data that our customers send us, since that's kind of important, all lives in another AWS account, and uh, we're trying to like start getting major systems into other AWS accounts like our warehouses product we'd like to like uh, lift and shift that into another account and, uh, and not supposed to say lift and shift yeah <laughs> dirty words Just, yeah and that's that's what we're that's what we're going towards like we're going towards this mm -hmm. like multi-account magical future where uh, you poke holes between teams to for them to talk uh, but that's like the makeup of uh, where we were, which was all one big account, and like where we're going, which is like teams per account. And uh, one of the major reasons for wanting to do that is just uh, like least privilege access. We can, instead of having to have IAM people write IAM policies all day and like pick individual resources that engineers are supposed to own and manage, they can just like say, okay, you're an admin, but of this domain of this account. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, then IAM policies get a lot simpler. Got it. That actually makes a lot of sense because uh, getting IAM policies right is is quite a quite an exercise, and a, a lot of companies uh, struggle with that. And also, they kind of struggle sometimes with uh, the shared responsibility model that that a lot of the cloud providers uh, put forth. Um, you know, that obviously seems like the right right way to do it. What do you think people get wrong when it comes to the shared responsibility with with cloud? <laughs> I just think there's a lot of features you can like shoot yourself in the foot with, like public buckets is like the most obvious one, uh, and keys, like keys are really hard to manage. Uh, AWS keys, like they, you have a bucket, like for some reason people keep finding AWS keys in buckets. Like I was reading, I was looking for a talk that I did at B-Sides for like uh, breaches that happened recently and I found one where hackers found keys in a bucket that Viacom had left open and then they took the keys and then like yep. those were the whole keys to the kingdom and uh, so I, I really just think it's like they have features that can be used badly and uh, I think that's uh, yeah the shared responsibility model is like you still have responsibility, and that's the <laughs> that's the problem <laughs> right yeah and the lines can uh, be can be blurred sometimes if you if you don't really fully understand it. But yeah, key management is, is obviously one that we see a lot of breaches. Um, it's, it's always some S3 bucket that was exposed or an API key that was just pushed to public GitHub repo, and you know obviously those those lead to uh, to serious problems. Um, another thing you wrote about is how uh, you do key management uh, with segments. So maybe tell us a little a little bit about the, the stuff behind that. So there's. <laughs> There's two pieces. Uh, one is like how we manage AWS keys, which is different than how we manage um, like regular API keys and secrets. So secrets, we just use AWS Parameter Store, which is like super simple and uh, based on IAM. And we've done a lot of automation with like how our engineers spin up services. So all the services are isolated to just their secrets. Um, and then engineers have really good tooling to to like make them want to manage their secrets this way. Uh, we have a whole tooling team and some of the people on there are like just great engineers who built really good tools that our engineers want to use. Uh, 
So that went a long way. And then the other piece is our AWS keys specifically. Uh, we don't have any engineers with AWS keys at all. It's all like on the fly, Okta, IDP, SAML assertions into the AWS account. Uh, and then you get temporary credentials which expire. So hopefully mm -hmm. people will never put those on GitHub, but they really don't need to. Uh, and if they do, it'll only be for 15 minutes before they're, uh, they're no good. Right, there's, there's two parts of it. There's, there's the actual credential management, and then there's minimizing the risk of an exposed credential. And if you can do both well, then your security posture is a little better than, uh, than yep. most others. Um, AWS recently launched their Secrets Manager product. I'm actually asking this because I'm not even sure. What's the difference between Secrets Manager and Parameter Store? <laughs> I think Secrets Manager, they can charge more for. Yeah. It's uh, like 40 cents a secret. Got it. And Makes then sense. when you have yeah. like thousands of them, it kind of does meaningfully add up. But with Parameter Store, you're paying like pennies on the dollar for KMS API calls, and it, it's like really cheap. It's like. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Now, you guys um, all bought in 100% to AWS. Do you, you do anything on other clouds? So we are, have like dangled a phishing line into GCP, basically, and we have like some stuff over there, uh, but it's not a whole lot. Uh, it's just like a Kubernetes GKE and then mm -hmm. a big table and a big query for some things, but it's mostly just AWS. Yeah. If you were to kind of dip in a little further, what, what sort of issues would you run into from all of these kind of credential identity management across multiple clouds? <laughs> I think it'd be a mess uh, <laughs> just because uh, we have like really good tooling on AWS now and AWS has really good SDKs and really good APIs that we can consume to uh, like build on top of really good tools and um, that's not quite there yet on GCP mm -hmm. and I really think that would be the main issue. Also, like IAM is different on GCP. There's like no one, like you can't just, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping between AWS and GCP. So it's um, it's like, we couldn't just build what we have over there. We'd have to like figure out how to do secrets management from the start. We'd have to figure out how do we do Id identity and access management from the start. and. Uh, mm -hmm. So it'd be, it'd be quite a bit of learning and figuring out how it would look over there. Right. Yeah, you can introduce an entirely new set of policies and, and IAM configurations that, yeah. Um, that's a challenge that I think a lot of companies have. It, uh, they get scared by vendor lock-in, but then the, the multi-cloud world is sometimes even harder uh, to try to, to wrap your head around. Um, we, we deal with that a lot with our, with our customers. Um, great, so you know, you're obviously very good at managing cloud and infrastructure and security. Um, you're a fast-growing company, fast-moving. How do you balance these kind of really you know, granular, strict uh, access controls with kind of employee productivity, and making sure the developers aren't you know, impacted too, too much on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so <laughs> my thought process here has been like we're slowly tightening screws on developers while we build tools to help them replace their previous bad workflow with like something that they're okay using and that they like and uh, that they can do, do securely and like have a pull request to review changes or like have a manager, like a, like a deployment manager system that will help them deploy things. That's one big mm -hmm. thing that launched recently um, from our tooling team is like building a deployment manager. So now people aren't just like going in the AWS UI and uh, spinning up new, their new service uh, without any reviews. So um, it really has been like figure out security wise what the next steps are and then figure out how to tighten the screws and what we have to build to replace the old functionality. Right. Yeah, I mean the, the last the last 10 years have been kind of a bit of a free for all on shadow IT developers kind of just can go, oh I can do this all this stuff myself and now security has kind of been like, well actually we have some new policies in place. And that's why all um, our buckets are public. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but all of the automations in place to kind of streamline that, if you do that right, then you have you know, productive developers who feel like they have the freedom to go do what they want, but then you know, happy security people that feel like everything works good. So that's the best of both worlds. Um, and I think you know, having the expertise uh, <laughs> helps you get there. Um, I've never asked you this, so I don't, I don't know. This could be, this is an open question. What do you think about BeyondCorp as an architecture? <laughs> I think it's pretty good. The, uh, I think it's the right way to do it. 
that uh, like build your um, architecture and like your identity and access management to your like cloud. Um, it is like one thing that I was when you sent me. Uh, I I hope this doesn't like uh, <laughs> kill the event, but there were questions that were sent to me before, and when I read this one. I, about what you were oh, going to yeah. ask, yeah. I was like, "Hmm, I wonder what Beyond Corp would look like if Segment uh, if Segment adopted it." And one thing that would be really challenging is like device identity. That's a major yeah. piece to Beyond Corp, and that's like like the furthest people go for device identity. A lot of times in big enterprises is like they put a barcode on it, mm -hmm. and uh, and then they install their VPN, their corporate VPN on it. And I think that's a big challenge. Uh, that we would have to solve, but I, I think it is like, way better. Yeah. Like, um, so when somebody steals the laptop, you can just like, revoke the, revoke the private key that's inside of it, and uh, in some management interface, and go on with your life instead right. of, uh, instead of it being a big mess. Yeah, if you're making an authorization decision based on some sort of device posture, you have to know about that device. Yeah. And every company does this differently. Um, Google, you know, has a very strict policy of all managed devices. Everything gets provisioned by IT. It's, you know, it's all inventory. They, they, that was a major piece of the architecture. You go to any other company and it's like, well, we don't really have that streamlined. You've got, you know, we let people bring their own laptops in or work from their phones. And how do you deal with a different, you know, support different operating systems, different devices. That's a big challenge. Um, but we see a lot of people working with you know, various fleet management uh, providers to say, all right, we, as long as we can, we can inventory this, we know it exists and it's tied to this person, that's, that's good enough. Um, but then actually poking in and saying like, well, this operating system hasn't been updated or you know, it's not running the version of AV that we want. Like, how do you get all that information in a you know, streamlined way? That's, it's a big challenge of the architecture, um, but we're, we're seeing a lot of kind of evolution from you know, various companies you know, poking into the device a little bit more. Um, so yeah, you're, you're looking at it absolutely the right way of, this looks really cool, but man, that device stuff is pretty, pretty hard. Um, so good, I'm glad that you at least uh, believe in the, in the kind of architecture. Um, so yeah, in terms of, uh, let's see, access management, we covered pretty much uh, um, all of that. So, what, what do you see, kind of, as you know, your next, uh, without giving away too much of what you're what you're working on, um, you're, you know, you, the next big project you're going to tackle? Because you said you weren't quite all the way there yet. What's what's left? <laughs> uh, so, one big thing that we need to address is like change management and having real um, processes and policies around it, and also addressing it since developer productivity is super important. Addressing it in a sane way that people are happy about. And uh, like in the tightening the screws fashion, what my plan has been for this is to revoke everybody's ability to create resources in the UI and force them to go to Terraform to create it. Uh, since we are a big Terraform shop in, with AWS, and, I, and I, once they have to create resources out of the UI, they're like more likely to manage the resources not in the UI. Uh, because the Terraform will like get mad at you every time <laughs> it runs, and so I've I've really been thinking about like how do we go from where we're at change management wise to like up our level in a really sane way, like mm -hmm. to take away people's access slowly and build automation around. Uh, Got it. Around how people do things now, which they might just like go in the UI and create RDS instance or spin up EC2 instance, right. and then. It's just such a mess fixing that later, because, like from a change management perspective, because that that's like the only way to manage it now, that, since it was created um, in that bad way. Infrastructure is code. Yep, it helps. Uh, great. Well, yeah. Thank you again so much for coming and, and sharing some thoughts. I guess we'll uh, we got a few minutes for uh, for questions. Robert. Yeah, we've we've recently we've recently got a uh, Carbon Black installed on everybody's laptop, but it's like not 
I don't think that has the amount of control that we really need uh, for something like Beyond Corp uh, that we can build on top of as well. We would really like something that we can build on top of to streamline any processes that we want. Um, so is there I, something better than that? I don't know that much about it. I'm, I don't know much about Carbon Black either. My impression is like it's just our AV tool and uh, like we have some capabilities beyond it, beyond like just scanning people's laptops and making sure they're patched, but it's not like a ton and it's not a really rich API we can build on top of. Got it. So. It's also worth noting that you don't have to take over the device or have all that as part of a BeyondCorp architecture. It's one of the many inputs into making an authoriz authorization decision. If, you're, if your policy you know, doesn't necessarily have to factor that in, you can still do all of the BeyondCorp stuff and then maybe insert that in later if oh, you start wait. getting scary. Uh, doesn't, scared. <laughs> doesn't Carbon Black not support Linux? We do have a lot uh, of... I don't know. We have a lot of... Uh, that would do it. I can think of uh, <laughs> I can think of two directors of engineering at our company who have Linux laptops, and they will like not part with those. They'll be in their casket when they go. <laughs> <laughs> it's the year of Linux on the desktop, yeah, 2018. It is. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I don't know enough about it, Paul. <laughs> You're talking about like screw tightening, but like, how does that work with like prioritization? How do you get them to listen to you in some ways? Is it, is it is everyone respects security like you need to do this, or is it you're always wrangling these directors that like Linux? Uh, so I think part of that is like everybody is on the. I think everybody is totally bought into security, and the company does have a priority to start getting compliance certifications and up level ourselves to sell to way bigger companies and make way more money. And I think people are bought in that that has to happen and uh, then on the other side we're being respectful of like okay we're not just gonna turn everything off for them and uh, roll out really janky processes that nobody's happy with so it's like mm -hmm. it really just requires you to go to a table with them and uh, talk about the plan and figure out what your how it's gonna look and what has to change and how painful that might be and then trying it out and seeing if it's painful, and working on pain points. Sounds, sounds agile. Yeah. <laughs> I think we got time for one more, if anybody's got a question. Yes. Sure. Companies like Segment in place, like what, what is the future of CASB in general? Of what? Of CASB. CASB. CASB solutions in general, where the market heading to, like, because uh, there's a lot of the things that CASB uh, do uh, many many products can do, or they can, they're they have the right platform. They just need to extend it a bit, be it a, a CDN platform like Cloudflare or something. Like so like uh, Segment can provide that insights that we typically use the dedicated CASB solution. So I actually have no idea what a CASB is. Cloud Access Security Broker. Is uh. that am I am I getting my acronyms right here? I think that's it. Um, it's an, yeah, it's another term for kind of access controls at, at the kind of like a CDN type of uh, layer. But I think it's usually used more for, for controlling the traffic out of a company. So like if you want to block out your employees from using Facebook from 9 to 5, you do mm. something like that. Um, I think we, we look at BeyondCorp as more of a kind of access control from like an um, internal resource perspective. So they're, they're similar architecturally, but I think products solve different uh, different uh, use cases, so. Um, but the architecture is all kind of kind of there. If you can have kind of this distributed CDN-like architecture that can evaluate policy and make kind of a real-time attestation of trust, that's all very BeyondCorp-like. Um, it's just different acronyms for the kind of use cases, <laughs> I think. But yeah, cool. All right, I think, uh, I think we'll, we'll call that then. Thank you so much, Evan, for, for yep. joining us Thanks on stage here. Me. Thank you. All right. And we'll take another five, ten minute break and we'll just get right on to the next one. Thank you. <laughs>